Welcome to Science View, where we cover the latest advances in Japanese science and technology. I'm your navigator, Tomoko Kimura, and this week's science watcher is Dr. Tomoko Tashiro of Aoyama Gakuin University. Hi, I'm glad to be here with you today. Here is today's lineup. On the leading edge, we'll be introducing cartilage conduction, along with a new aspect of bone conduction. We'll show you how they work and their different applications, such as hearing aids. And on J Innovators, Michelle? I'll be introducing a Takumi or innovator who modified industrial robots and introduced them to areas that were previously too difficult to automate. Let's begin with today's Science News Watch. Dr. Tashiro? Geostationary meteorological satellite Himawari 8 was launched with a H2A carrier rocket from the Tanegashima Space Center in Kagoshima Prefecture on October 7, 2014. The images of Earth taken by this weather observation satellite will be used for weather forecasts and other purposes. Compared to the current satellite Himawari 7, which can only take black and white images once every 30 minutes, the new Himawari 8 can take color images once every two and a half minutes. Having images in color will make it easier to tell yellow dust and volcanic gas apart from the clouds. The Japan Meteorological Agency will be able to monitor rain clouds and predict typhoon routes more precisely. After its launch, the Himawari 8 used a small engine to change course three times before entering its planned geostationary orbit on October 16th. Its functions will be checked and tested, and it's scheduled to go into operation from the summer of 2015. Himawari 8 is attracting global attention as it will go into operation earlier than American and European next-generation weather satellites. Its greatly improved performance capabilities will make detailed analysis regarding wind direction, wind speed, and temperature possible. The acquired data will be distributed to 30 countries in the Asia-Pacific region. It's expected to contribute towards more accurate forecasts and disaster prevention. And now for the leading edge. Today we'll start off with cartilage conduction. It's been called the third sound transmission pathway. Yes, the first pathway is air conduction. The sounds that we normally hear are air vibrations that are picked up by the eardrum. The second pathway is through bone conduction. It is when sound is conducted through vibration of the skull. Bone conduction earphones and hearing aids have already been commercialized. Then, we have what is receiving attention as the third sound transmission pathway, which is what we'll be covering today, cartilage conduction. Can you explain how it works? Well, unlike bone conduction, which uses the vibration of the skull, cartilage conduction transmits sound through cartilage vibration. With the exception of the earlobe, the human ear is made almost entirely out of cartilage. That's where the focus is on. If research into cartilage conduction progresses, then we may see a big change in a certain object most people use every day. This manufacturer is applying cartilage conduction to the development of various products. One of them is this smartphone. At first glance, it looks like an ordinary smartphone, but the sound output mechanism is very different. The secret is in this part here. The black part is a transducer and it causes slight vibrations. This is the part that vibrates. But when we put a mic near it, it didn't pick up any sound. This is because the sound is only audible when the transducer is in contact with the ear's cartilage. This kind of smartphone would be useful in a place like this. The noise at this crosswalk is an average of 100 decibels. 
Since a phone with cartilage conduction technology seems to work in such a loud setting, we decided to perform an experiment in an equally loud karaoke room. The room's noise level is about the same as the crosswalk shown earlier. For this experiment, we have a smartphone with cartilage conduction technology and a conventional smartphone. A person in a separate location will give instructions over the phone, and the listener will act out what they hear. Let the experiment begin. First up is the conventional smartphone. Please pretend that you're doing the hula. Please pretend that you're doing the hula. She couldn't hear the instructions. The other three also tried, but were unable to hear what was being said. I could faintly hear something, but it wasn't clear at all. With all this noise, the results aren't surprising. Next up was a smartphone with cartilage conduction technology. The instructions were to pose like a ballerina. She appears to have received the message. All of the participants were able to hear what was being said. I heard it perfectly the first time. It was no different from how I normally hear things. That seemed like a really fun experiment. So cartilage conduction technology makes it possible to have a conversation even in loud environments. Yes, but that's not its only advantage because sound is only audible when the unit is pressed against cartilage. It doesn't need speakers. So people around you won't be able to hear what's being said. If this technology is applied to earphones, then people can turn up the volume and listen to music on crowded trains or in other public spaces, and it won't disturb anybody. Precisely. Take a look at this. This shows how a person hears sound through cartilage conduction. For this experiment, a transducer was attached to the participant's ear cartilage. This is the sound that will be transmitted. This thin stick-like mic will be used to gauge where the sound originates. First, it was held outside the ear. But as soon as it was inserted into the ear, The mic is picking up the sound. Yes, the sound becomes louder. It's strange that the sound is only audible inside the ear and not outside it. Can you explain how it works? Of course. Let's compare cartilage conduction with the way we normally hear sounds. Take a look at this. This is what happens with air conduction. The air vibrations are received by the eardrum and ultimately transmitted to a snail-shaped part called cochlea. The cochlea converts the vibrations into electric signals, which are sent to the brain. There, it's registered as sound. I see. So the main points are the eardrum and the cochlea. Yes. Now let's take a look at bone conduction. It's when the skull is vibrated and the vibrations are conveyed directly to the cochlea. So the eardrum doesn't have to be vibrating for the sound to reach the cochlea. Exactly. With bone conduction, the eardrum is bypassed and the sound is delivered directly to the cochlea. Then we have the third option, cartilage conduction. The parts in yellow are cartilage. The vibrations are first sent to the cartilage. The vibrations are communicated through the cartilage in the walls of the ear canal. And this is the main point because the air within the ear begins to vibrate and this produces sound. The eardrum begins to vibrate in turn and then it reaches the cochlea. I see. So the vibrations are conveyed through the cartilage and produce sound in the ear itself. Yes. The cartilage within the walls of the ear canal works a lot like speakers. 
And that's why the person with the device can hear the sound clearly, but other people can't. That's right. About 10 years ago, a Japanese doctor confirmed that cartilage conduction and bone conduction had different characteristics. The difference was established by Hiroshi Hosoi, the current president of Nara Medical University. Hosoi is an ENT doctor and specializes in auditory disorders. A big problem was that many hearing loss patients were unable to use conventional hearing aids. This is because some people are born without an ear canal, while others suffer from ear discharge. It's estimated that about 350,000 people in Japan are unable to use conventional hearing aids. In such cases, bone conduction hearing aids were their best option. However, bone conduction hearing aids had a downside. Normally, the slight difference between what the left and right ear hears allow us to localize a sound source. This is why we are able to turn in the right direction when we are called. However, with bone conduction, it's difficult to determine the sound source and respond accordingly. When my friends call me from behind, I'll sometimes turn in the wrong direction. It's hard to tell where they are. With bone conduction, the entire skull vibrates, and the sound is distributed almost equally to both the left and right ear. It's a fundamental trait that cannot be avoided. Would it be possible to make a better hearing aid? While pondering this question, Hosoi happened to have a transducer at hand. He began to absent-mindedly tap it against his head. When it came into contact with the cartilage of his ear, he noticed a distinct difference in how it sounded. It was different from how I normally hear things. I couldn't put my finger on what it was, but I just knew that it was different. And that was the starting point. A study revealed that sound was produced within the ear. This new method had the potential to help people with blocked ear openings. Hosoi enlisted the help of several patients and experimented with a transducer. Almost all the patients told him that they could hear better with cartilage conduction. Five years ago, he held a collaborative study with a manufacturer and developed a cartilage conduction hearing aid prototype. By fitting the device onto both ears, the patient is able to localize the sound source. With cartilage conduction, I can tell which way a person's voice is coming from. So I like it much, much better. It's not something I'm normally conscious of, but being able to determine which direction a sound is coming from is very important. Yes. And if, for example, you couldn't tell which way a car or train was coming from, then it affects your safety as well. That's right. Has the cartilage conduction hearing aid been commercialized? Unfortunately, it's still in the clinical trial stage and isn't available yet. They are making some necessary modifications and are working to put it to practical use as soon as possible. Does it have any other advantages? Yes. With regular hearing aids, sound that leaks out can be picked up and amplified by the mic which causes howling. This could be prevented by pressing the hearing aid deep into the ear and making sure there aren't any openings, but it's uncomfortable. Cartilage conduction has the possibility to solve these problems. So cartilage conduction doesn't leak sound and it might be able to take away the need to press the hearing aid into your ear to prevent howling. Yes. Bone conduction hearing aids also have to be pressed strongly against the bone to effectively convey vibrations, and it can be painful. But cartilage conduction hearing aids work by being pressed lightly against the cartilage, so it's much easier to use. It sounds very promising. However, not all people with hearing disabilities can use cartilage conduction hearing aids, and that's where this comes in. Please take a look at this. A dolphin? Do dolphins have something to do with today's theme? Yes, they do. 
Do you remember what dolphins use to communicate among themselves? Uh, yes, it's a sound that humans can't hear, ultrasound. Yes, they use extremely high frequencies to communicate among themselves. And the way that the dolphins hear it is through bone conduction. And not with their ears. Precisely. Dolphins have ear openings, but they don't function much. Their lower jaw bone does the work. The bone serves as an antenna and picks up the glottal sound signals that are transmitted in the water, then sends it to the eardrum. That's very interesting. Just now, you commented that auto sounds are inaudible to humans. You may be surprised to know that people can actually hear auto sounds through bone conduction. An experiment was held to test whether it was possible for people to hear ultrasounds by seeing whether it would activate the auditory region of the brain. A magnetoencephalography machine was used to monitor the brain's response. A special transducer was attached behind the participant's ear, and an ultrasound of 30,000 hertz was played to the participant through bone conduction. And then... I could hear a string of high-pitched sounds with intervals in between. But did the brain register it as sound? Let's see how it reacted. As you can see, the part that covers the auditory region reacted sharply. This here is the auditory region's reaction. This is the auditory region that reacts to regular sounds. As you can see, the same region reacted to an ultrasound of 30,000 hertz. This shows that the brain registered the bone-conducted ultrasound as sound. We were surprised to learn that the auditory sense is capable of perceiving sounds that are over 20,000 hertz. Spoken words could also be communicated via ultrasound. In this experiment, words will be communicated via ultrasound. Hero. Veranda. A special method was used to convert 50 words into ultrasound. These words will be played to an able-bodied participant through bone conduction. The participant will write down the words she is able to hear and the score will be tallied. Let the experiment begin! The participant began writing words down. She appears to hear them clearly and shows no signs of hesitation. Okay, that's it. It was like a person was talking. It was very clear. The only difference was that it seemed more like an echo than an actual voice. In this experiment, the participant was able to accurately hear 45 out of 50 words. I plan to continue research and development and hope to make it easier for people to use. This study is especially promising for people with profound or severe hearing loss. Take a look at this. The ultrasound experiment that we just saw was repeated with people who suffer from severe hearing loss. Here are the results. According to this, almost half of the participants were able to make out some kind of sound. Does this mean that the cochlea is still functional? Yes. If they are able to hear ultrasounds, then this shows that the cochlea is at least capable of perceiving ultrasounds. However, only a fraction of the people who could hear the sounds were able to understand what was being said. I hope that research progresses to the point that they could develop hearing aids for those with severe hearing loss. The discovery of the mechanism of cartilage conduction and our ability to hear ultrasounds shows that we have abilities that we weren't previously aware of. And studies like these will undoubtedly lead to new solutions that will make life easier for those with hearing disabilities.
I'm buying bread that costs 123 yen. I'll pay for it using this 1,000 yen bill. The bill is inserted here. And the change is exactly 877 yen. This machine gives you the change, and it's connected to a cash register. It's very useful, don't you think? Hi, Michelle. Today, I'm not going to introduce the person who made this change machine, but I'm going to introduce you to a Takumi or innovator who organized the production line of this machine using a humanoid robot. This is the factory where the humanoid robots are in action. It is a company that develops and manufactures money handling machines and systems. Hello, I'm Michelle Yamamoto. Nice to meet you. Hello, I'm Tobita. Today's Takumi is Akio Tobita. He's said to be a magician with humanoid robots. So, this is the humanoid robot? That's right. The robot itself is made by another company. We bought it and customized the hand part from the wrist on down. So it's capable of doing complicated assembly tasks. A name is written on the chest. Yes. We added a country flag and named each robot after the country's currency. It gives them a friendlier feel. Not only does each robot have a different name, each one is equipped with a different set of hands. Tobita and his team created more than 90 types of hands to meet a variety of needs. This is a special hand that took two months to develop. It was made for a specific task. It's made to strip the paper off the adhesive tape, a task that's not easy even for humans. The solution was to make the nail part out of resin and program it to emulate the peeling movement of a human. This enables the robot to expertly peel the paper off. Tobita first saw the humanoid robot at an industrial robot exhibition in 2009. I instinctively knew that we could use this robot at our company. I noticed that the robot was compact and could work in the same amount of space as a person. Tobita developed these skillful hand parts and attached them to the compact robot. There's something I want to show you. Yes. This is it. Whoa! This is a sight that I've never seen before. A robot is working alongside a person. That's right. Until now, industrial robots were mainly used to repeat simple tasks at high speed. Tobita's factory managed many complex operations that industrial robots weren't able to handle. However, Tobita believed that by equipping the robots with sophisticated hand parts, they could be incorporated into the assembly line. But the complicated movements raised an issue. It's slower than a standard industrial robot. To improve work efficiency, both the right and left hands needed to move simultaneously. That's where I had the hardest time. The humanoid robots are assembling the part where the coins are inserted. It is made up of around 60 parts. Let me show you live from the spot how the robots collaborate to make a device. Let's go! Our first runner-up is Mademoiselle Frank. She is working on some rubber bands. And there she goes. She takes the rubber band and holds it tight with both hands. And there she places it right on the device. And there she goes. She hands it over to the next player. Each robot takes about five minutes to complete their task. They skillfully attach their piece to the unit that is passed to them. 
And our last robot up is Mr. Rubel. Okay, let's ask him how he feels working here. Mr. Rubel, how is it working here? Well, it's lots of fun working here. And that's probably what it would say. And our last player is over here, a human. So after a long line of robots, now we have a human being finishing up. And she's giving the final touches to the device. Let's ask her how she feels working with robots. What is it like to work with robots? At first, I was a bit apprehensive, but now we are good partners. It takes about 30 minutes to complete one unit. By incorporating humanoid robots, production can go on through the night, and this has improved the company's production rate. Tobita is thinking of developing the robots further. I wanted to use the experience that I've acquired over the years and create things that will amaze people. The challenge for me is to keep producing new innovations and also improve what I've already made. So, what did you think? I was impressed at how good the teamwork was between the robots and the workers. So each robot is programmed individually. Exactly. Every movement was so human-like. I thought they were amazing and also very cute. Thank you very much, Michelle. Dr. Tashiro, how would you wrap up today's program? Today we covered cartridge conduction. Although it can be applied to smartphones and earphones, I expect its greatest potential to be in hearing aids. Of the people with hearing impairments in Japan, one in five have a condition that prevents them from using regular hearing aids. And the possibility of being able to hear auto sounds with bone conduction is also very good news for people with hearing disabilities. I look forward to seeing new progress. That's it for Science View. See you next time.